After nine months and a staggering 48,000 kilometers, Spencer Conway is on the final leg of his epic journey solo around Africa on a motorcycle. He's endured a near fatal shooting, theft, rough accommodation and treacherous roads. But he's also experienced the beauty and the people of this vast continent. Traveling light after leaving most of his gear in the Congo Republic, Spencer enters Senegal with just a toothbrush and dirty pants. Just arrived in Senegal about 10 minutes ago, and uh, surprise, surprise, the national highway marked on the Michelin map as a tarred sealed road is, voila, a dirt road full of corrugation. After crossing the border at Madak, Spencer's route through Senegal will take him to the capital, Dakar, for bike repairs and visas. From there, he hopes to travel to San Louis, and then onto the Mauritanian border crossing at Rosso. Okay, I'm 180 kilometers from Dakar, and not a good start to the day. For some unknown reason, sometimes you can't explain these things, my chain snapped. All modern bikes have got these grooves on them where you can adjust the wheel to change the tension on the chain. Make sure it's exact, otherwise the wheel's not aligned properly, but I think the bearings are I think there's lots of things wrong. Yeah, I'll tell you what, eh, that chap upstairs with the beard, uh, God, Allah, Jah, whatever his name is, he must have a real sense of humor. I mean, I go 42,000 kilometers to get to Dakar, which is the place that's the most famous motorbike race in the world, and I'm on the motorbike that won it, and I'm limping in there at 60 kilometers an hour. It's, you know, I like a challenge, I really don't mind it at all, but the, the problem is it's the cost. Arriving in the busy streets of Dakar, our weary traveler checks into some luxury accommodation with an aircon unit, an ensuite bathroom. Hey, nice shot. Right, I'm in Dakar, in Senegal. I've arrived and I've got myself an apartment and a half. This is my lounge, I suppose. And the master bedroom, that's it. And a television, look, can you believe it? Out there is Dakar. Immersion. After a few days, the bike repairs are done, visas obtained, and with fresh underwear, Spencer is back on the road, traveling north to Mauritania, but not in the best of moods. I've left Dakar and tell you the truth, I'm absolutely shattered. For the first time, I don't know, it's really taken it out of me. And I got myself into a bit of trouble. Um, basically, these three guys came up to me, well, sat at my table, and they uh, just started ordering food and drink. And then when it came to me leaving, they insisted that I had to pay, and then they told the waitress that I'd agreed to pay for them. I refused, I wandered off, and they came and started pushing me around, so I hit two of them. But unfortunately, the police were there immediately and ended up paying 120 euros, or I would have had to go to court. All right, I better go, because there's a car here, and I think I'm probably on someone's land. Avoiding court and 120 euros lighter, Spencer continues to San Louis, but his day is not improving. It's the first time in Africa that I've ever driven to find a pretty place um, to eat my lunch and gave up. It's a hell hole. I really didn't expect it in Senegal. But look at that. Tuna. Mayonnaise and a baguette. So I'm gonna tuck in. Mm. With a belly full of baguette, the troubles of the past few days evaporate and morale is high as he arrives at his next destination. Okay, I'm in San Louis, which is the city in the northern section of Senegal. Now it's a real, real surprise. Now the weird thing about it is that during colonial times it's divided, it's got the mainland, and then a small island about 12 kilometers long and then connected by a bridge. Now this island that I'm on used to be the white island during colonial times. And it's got incredible French architecture, wrought iron, 
you know, verandas, all that sort of thing, and it's very, very peaceful by African standards. Whereas the sandbar just across the water is the black area. So obviously a very racist setup, but it lends to a really, really amazing city, I tell you. Obviously a bit run down, uh, but great, really great. After a short stop at San Louis, looking around at what remains of Senegal's colonial days, Spencer pushes on towards Rosso, the border crossing. OK, I'm leaving uh, Senegal right now. I'm on the ferry. I'm heading across the river Senegal into Mauritania, and then from Mauritania on from there. Anyway, it's not hectic. There's only about one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cars on here. Loads of kids hassling, though. So you can see, on the other side is Mauritania. Although Mauritania is the 11th largest country in Africa, it only has a population of 3.5 million. 90% of the country is desert, so Spencer will be spending a lot of time on his own. OK, I'm in Mauritania, I've made it. I had to come across on the ferry, which cost, I had to pay for insurance. You have to pay to clear the bike, you have to pay for your carne to pass out. It's, it's, it's absolute 100% corruption. So you've got to have another $100 on you just to get through the border, even if you've got everything else. Um, right, I'm here, a little bit worried about it. Only 220 k's to uh, knock chot the capital. Shouldn't be so bad. Oh my God, I'm in the desert again. My God, it's stunning. It really is. I just wanted to stop to show you the colour of these sand dunes. Quite a place, eh? Yeah, Mauritania is a strange place because it's the only sub-Saharan uh, African country that's uh, Islamic. And also, it's the only country in West Africa that is run by uh, by nomads, because in other countries, nomads are often looked down upon, but here they're the majority, so they call the shots, really. So they've got Sharia law here, so I've sort of toned down a little bit. OK, I'm leaving uh, Nuadaba. Um, knock shot, sorry, for Nuadaba right now. I uh, didn't get to film much, because... I arrived late last night and I'm leaving early, early morning because I've got 500 kilometres to get through. The city was built in the 60s to become the new capital, so it's one of the newest sort of capitals in the world, but it uh, doesn't have any character. Travelling through this vast emptiness, not knowing where his essential fuel and water sources will be, Spencer takes precautions by packing extra litres. Yeah, this is really, really heavy duty. There's nobody around. There's no electricity poles. There's absolutely nothing. It's proper full-on desert. So I'm running out of water. My clutch has snapped. This is incredible. My heart is racing. If the bike doesn't start, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a last view, and then I'm just going to really hit it, hit it, hit it, because I don't feel very safe. the most incredible days, not of just of this trip, but of my whole life, I promise you. It's, it's absolutely magical, this place, magical. It has been, I've been constantly, constantly sandblasted. Libya, Egypt, and those kind of places, they've got uh, villages along the way and such like, but here, yeah, it's just nothing. Mauritanian border was hilarious. It was just a tent with three guys asleep in it. It changed my money and everything. Anyway, here I am in Western Sahara, so I got through okay. It looks pretty similar to uh, Mauritania. It's just a little, little less windy and a um, little more hilly. That's it, really. There is really only one road through the sparsely populated Western Sahara to Morocco. His route takes him through Dakla to reach the border at Alaoun. It's approximately 980 kilometers, and Spencer's hoping to do it in two days, if he doesn't fall asleep. 
just taking a break because it's kind of like it's like driving in the snow you end up not being able to see properly and uh, the, it's got a hell of a lot whiter here but uh, I'm beginning to lose my concentration again and not able to see so it, hey very strange okay um, drove 840 kilometers today just in time because the sun is going to go down soon um, I came to the outskirts of a town well not really a town it's still in the desert but this guy let me stay in his warehouse it's sort of a yard uh, not very good because the ground is rock hard so I just had to make do so I've used the bike really and I'll probably be heading to Agadir tomorrow I could do this in the morning, but it's just on my mind at the moment. I've just been thinking about what have I achieved, you know? What has it done? Is it the most selfish thing in the world? I know I've brought this up before, but I mean, what this hasn't done my children or my girlfriend any good. Oh, it's just so difficult. I mean, I've left them for nine months. I've been on the road for nearly nine months now, and I just hope something comes out of it. I absolutely love Africa, and I love motorbikes. So I've just got to go down that route. Uh, I'm just blithering on. <laughs> Okay, it's six o'clock in the morning and uh, I'm still in the desert and I'm still in the wind. Um, it's freezing, freezing cold. It must be, must be close to zero. Despite the cold desert morning, Spencer makes good progress. The temperature, like the kilometers on his clock, rapidly rises as he arrives at the Moroccan border. Got out of the desert, but I'm still in the shadow of the valley of death. Went into the pharmacy in the town just back there. He said, it, it, uh, we checked up, it's 50. 50 degrees bang on dead on his thermometer. And that's an outside thermometer in the sun. But anyway, so this is what the road looks like. So it looks like I'm heading off. Check out this lovely old blue Mercedes. They've all drive Mercedes, by the way. just heading around from Agadir to Marrakesh and I'm in the high Atlas Mountains just nipping the west side of them just getting into them but it's still pretty spectacular you're planning a trip to Africa but you don't want all the hassles of Africa then Morocco is a good option um, there's a difference between touring and adventure motorcycling adventure motorcycling is where you dealing with hardcore stuff, with the elements, with uh, bureaucracy. I mean, in, the, in these kind of areas we're in now, where it's touring, you've got good tar roads, good communications, good road signs. It's only when you go into Mauritania and other places around there that it becomes uh, adventure riding. And how much adventure riding depends on you as well. Okay, I'm in a town called Chechchain. I can't even say it properly. It's magical here. You might have noticed I've had a slight haircut. It was hilarious. I went and asked um, this hairdresser if he'd cut my hair. And he said, no problem. I just said, just a little bit off, and he completely cocked it up. So I had to go to somebody else to get it done. And it's basically disappeared now. Only a mother would love it, eh? No, I'm really enjoying it here. Morocco is just, I, I was expecting nothing at all. Anyway, this place is nestled in um, a valley and you have to get here along those beautiful mountain passes. Oh, it doesn't really show you the whole city, but give you some idea. As you can see, it's not that big and you won't see it because of the sunlight, but there's the mountain behind. I'm outside a town called Kenitra, and uh, you can guess what it's famous for. I just thought I'd get in touch with my uh, bees, with my feminine side. Hello.
Okay, I've uh, been travelling about 250 days, maybe a little bit longer, I've sort of lost track of that. But I've come to quite a serious point now, I'm leaving Morocco, which is in the background, so it's my... I'm actually off African soil right now. So, feeling quite depressed, but still got Spain and uh, France to get through, so the trip isn't finished. On the 28th of July I'm in Tarifa in uh, the south of Spain, obviously where I got the ferry over. Just doing a bit of work on the bike before I head off. The oil's fine, uh, tightened up the chain a little bit. Best of all, I brought a little bit of Mauritania with me, I'll show you. Look at that, that's from my air filter. All I did was just tip it upside down and that came out. So I smuggled a bit of desert with me. Okay, uh, my diary cams are getting more and more depressing, I suppose. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm having culture shock. I can't believe it. I can't face people. I'm, I'm going to find this a lot more difficult than I thought. I thought the trip was going to be the difficult bit, and when I'd done it, I'd be all happy and yay, first person to circumnavigate Africa, but it hasn't worked out like that. I'm getting more and more down the more north I go. Everything that you take as normal disappears. Uh, when you're traveling in these sort of places. But I love them. I love these places. Oh. Okay, I'm going to stop now until I've got my thoughts together. Okay, I've continued up the coast and uh, the culture shop continues. I got very tired. I'm on the border with Spain and France in, people will know it, the Costa Brava and it's full of Dutch people, full of English people, and the streets are jam, jam packed, and I really, really can't take it. I expected a big epiphany and life-changing experience, and it's exactly what has happened right near the end of the trip. I've realized what it's all about, and I can't face telling you right now. Tomorrow I shall give you my big philosophical speech, because I'm a different man. Okay, I've just left Spain and didn't really do any filming because I was on a motorway and you could be in any country in the world, really. I'm just going to go down to the coast. It's about 20 kilometers to a place called Argel de Mer um, and Le Boulou. See, my French is good, eh? And uh, I'm gonna camp there tonight. Just gonna try and sum up exactly what this trip has done. I've been, the whole time I've been going along saying, oh, it's not life-changing, there's no great epiphany, there's no, no amazing thing that I've realized, but actually I have. It's really made me realize how important, what things are important to me, and focus on what's good in your life, not what's on bad, because bad attracts bad. And I think the biggest thing I've learned on this trip is to be more accepting of others. I used to be very, very critical of, of other people, and. For God's sake, I don't know why, because there's nothing special about me. I just try my best to be good to people and to not be self-centered and conceited. And yeah, it's, it's, it's so important to realize that, that every single person is different, completely different. After Spencer's emotional breakthrough, he mans up once more, gets off the beach and finally heads for home. But France has an unexpected bite creating one last ordeal. I find it quite hilarious. I've been all the way around Africa and I go and get stung by a bee. And uh, my foot's swollen up. I've got an allergy. I'm supposed to carry an EpiPen and I have got an EpiPen. I think that's the right way up. And uh, I'm just gonna jab it into my thigh. So I don't know if you wanna see my face or you wanna see my leg. I'll show you my leg and then my face. Right, apparently I just jab it in like that. So here goes. Hurts. All right, so it's all gone. All the liquids come out. God, that was quick. Whew. <laughs> I don't know if that worked, but I'm just, that's it. Okay, it's my final day, and I'm in a place called Chartres in France. I've got 550 kilometers uh, to Calais. I'm going to be hitting the motorway, so I won't be filming. The next time I'll be on the boat. 
uh, sorry, in Channel Tunnel and it'll all be over. I said I was going to be limping home. I was talking about uh, the bike and my equipment and everything. But I suppose it's fitting um, that I'm literally limping home. I couldn't get my boot on. So don't laugh. That's how I'm traveling. Okay, this is my very last diary camera. Um, I'm in England now. I'm actually in Smarden in the south of England and I'm only about 30 kilometers or so from my final destination, but I had to stay out here last night and my girlfriend came up to see me and we decided that we'd stick with the whole camping thing as it was the very, very last night of the trip. Luckily we met um, a farmer who allowed us to stay in here. So we were in like a poly tunnel. So that's my very, very last diary cam on this trip, day 268. See you, man. I'd just like to say thank you so much to my mum and dad. Non-stop work, absolutely non-stop work. And thanks to my girlfriend and my kids for waiting for me. And thanks to all of you guys for everything. Cheers. I was so excited when he was coming and there was so much suspense and everyone was just waiting. And then he came around the corner. It was an amazing entrance and all the bikes just came and it was just, it was a really emotional moment. The major, major worry for me was the fact that he would go too fast, go round the bend, come off his bike, hit a tree, and get injured. It sounds like an awful thing to say, but I wasn't really that worried. Of course, I was panicking after the shooting, particularly in a couple of other instances. I know pretty well what I think he's capable of doing, and I thought, if anybody could, I think Spencer could have a shot at it. I don't want to steal your thunder, but um, how much have you to date managed to raise to save the children? Uh, 26,166. Brilliant, well done. I had every confidence in him from the beginning that he would do it. He is a very determined young guy. Uh, he's strong, he's fit, and he's always been that way. Uh, when he wants to do something and he fixes it on his mind and does the preparation, he nearly always succeeds.